Welcome to How to Cook That. I'm Anne Reardon and this is Dave Reardon and this is an episode of Clever or Never where we test a bunch of kitchen gadgets so you can see if they are worth buying or not. And first up we have this unusual looking thing that says you can use it to open the top of drink cans wow. and then you can add like lemon or ice to your can. Amazing. Let's give it a go. It says to put it on top and squeeze. And then turn the can. Here we go. Ooh. I do think must be cutting. <laughs> cool. I don't know if my can is quite strong enough because when I try to turn the can, my actual can is bending. There we go. And oh, did anything happen? No. Look, it oh, has cut. Okay, okay. Oh. But not very well. It's cut three quarters of the way around. <laughs> this is classy. Uh, here's your drink. My thumb's uh, been in it and the lid of the drink, which is no doubt not clean, has also been in it. Oh, don't drink it. <laughs> uh, the can itself is clean. <laughs> Hold it further down, the can's a bit stronger. Oh dear, stop, stop. <laughs> This is not a Dave gadget. No, stop! I did it again! I'm not squeezing! <laughs> Let me try again. How are you doing? I don't know if it's cutting. It doesn't feel like it's cutting. That sounds yeah. like it just cut through for the first time. It and once it's, right once it's cutting, it has more resistance, so then it's harder to twist without denting the can. Oh well, no. That has not even cut halfway around. Mm, that's it's... odd. Well, this one was the best out of four. We gave it a good go. Yeah. What do you think? Was it a clever or never? Gadget number two is presented by you. It's a corn kerneler. I guess for getting the kernels of corn off the corn cob. I say that ten times fast. But I spotted it and thought, that looks ridiculous. I kind of like just eating corn on the cob. Correct. Here we go, a line top, slide down. Wait, I think we've got a clever on our hands. <laughs> not so easy on the pour out step. Oh, Does okay. it come open or not? And look, oh, look at that. That's much easier. Well, I still prefer eating corn on the cob to corn off the cob, but that is pretty clever. Yeah, I'm giving it a clever. I was sent multiple emails asking could we review this gadget because they want to know does it actually work. Well, it says... This little device thoroughly cleans all the bacteria and chemicals from your fruits and vegetables. Aquapure is such a great product. It removes more than 99% of bacteria and pesticides. Why is it smoking? That's not smoke, that's little bubbles. According to their website, Aquapure electrolyzes the water and produces chemicals that kill the bacteria and destroys pesticides. It sounds scientific. Do you think that's working? Yes. Do you <laughs> think it's working, Anne? I have my doubts, but there's no way of telling. I also have my doubts. There's no way of telling just by looking at it like this. There are lots of studies about using electrolyzed water, but that's completely different because that has two separate chambers. I think... To really explain that, I'm going to need to pull this one apart and do a few more tests. Insert it into the video here for you so you can see if this actually works in this form. In electrolysis, if you have a container of water, which is H2O, and then you add salt or NaCl, and then you run an electric current through the water, some changes are going to happen. You'll get hydrogen gas forming at the cathode and some chlorine gas at the anode and some sodium hydroxide. And according to their website, you will also get some of that sodium hydroxide reacting with the chlorine gas to make sodium hypochlorite or bleach. So they're saying the chlorine and the sodium hypochlorite is what is killing the bacteria. If we take a closer look inside of this, you can take the top off for cleaning and unscrew these two little bits and you can see inside you have this piece of plastic. And if we take that apart, you can see it's made up of two metal grates separated by a thin piece of plastic. Now each grate attaches to one of these screws which are going through and connecting to a rechargeable battery that sits on the base. If I connect the grates to the screws away from each other, then I should be able to collect the gases being produced separately from each side. 
We only seem to be getting bubbles from the one side. I suspect that's probably hydrogen. We can collect that in a test tube. And if it is hydrogen, it should make a nice pop sound when you put a match to it. Let's see. So we can confirm that it is making hydrogen bubbles, which look pretty and impressive, but they're not going to kill any bacteria. Now, because I wasn't getting any bubbles out of the other side, I'm going to use a whole new unit that I haven't pulled apart. And I'm going to test for the chlorine gas just by putting some blue litmus paper across here. If the bubbles are chlorine, it should bleach the paper white. Now for comparison, this is blue litmus paper that's just been wet with water. And this is the one that's been sitting in the bubbles and it's not bleached at all, which would indicate that either no chlorine is being produced or a very, very small amount. So why is that? Electrolysis of salt water is supposed to produce chlorine gas. Well, I'll show you if we add a heap of salt to the water. I'm going to have to heat that up to dissolve it and then cool it down. And now if I add the AquaPure, first of all, you'll notice it's floating because there's so much salt in there. But if I push it underwater and use the blue litmus test again, holding it in the bubbles, you can now see the paper is being bleached. You can actually see the stripes of blue where the plastic grate was protecting it from the gases. And I can smell the chlorine gas. It smells like a swimming pool. So when there is a concentrated salt solution, you get chlorine gas. But when it's a very dilute salt solution, because there's not much salt to react with, you tend to get mainly oxygen gas forming at the anode and just a little bit of chlorine. Their instructions only say to add a pinch of salt, which is only going to make a dilute salt solution. The other possibility is that any oxygen and chlorine being produced could be reacting with the metal of the anode, which would result in an orangey tinge to the water. But their website says that they've done studies which shows that it removes 99% of E. coli and 87% of salmonella. You don't want any salmonella in your food at all. So do not use this for meat or anything like that. Just cook your meat really well. Anyway, moving on, I did ask them for a copy of their studies and they said they would not send their official documents. They did, however, answer a couple of my questions about how much water they used, how many cycles, all of that sort of stuff. And they used four liters of water, one teaspoon of salt and ran it for two cycles, which I thought was interesting because the directions that came with my machine said one cycle and just a pinch of salt. So why are the studies that they're doing using different methods to the directions that are sent out to the customer? Well, I'm not sure, but what I can do is run some of my own tests. I have a carrot here. Let's cut it into pieces. Now for the first one, I'm going to add a whole teaspoon of salt to the water like they did, but I'm going to run the AquaPure just once because that's what the directions said, and then use a sterile swab to wipe along the carrot 15 times and then run that across an agar plate. For the next one, let's try a pinch of salt and one cycle, just like the directions said. Bacteria are so small that we can't see them with our eyes, but by putting them onto nutrient agar like this, it's giving them the ideal environment to multiply and form a colony. And colonies, once they get big enough, we are able to see. For the next bit of carrot, I'm going to run the AquaPure once with no salt at all, because I was sent an email after I'd purchased that said I could watch a video that showed how to use it. And in that video, it didn't use any salt at all. So let's see what results we get with that. And now in this bowl, I'm gonna add a teaspoon of salt and I'm not gonna use the AquaPure at all. I'm just gonna leave it for five minutes, which is the length of one cycle. And for the last one, I'm gonna clean it under running water for five seconds. Then you leave all of those for a couple of days to let those colonies grow. And these are the results. This one is the one that was left to soak in the bowl of salty water for five minutes without the AquaPure running. And you can see we have quite a few colonies of bacteria growing there, which is what you'd expect. That's why we need to wash our fruits and vegetables. Now this one was the AquaPure run with no salt at all, and it's not effective without salt. It's not going to do what it's promoting itself to do. This one is the AquaPure with just a pinch of salt, which is a very dilute salt solution. 
And this one is the Aqua Pure Run with a teaspoon of salt. So as you can see, it needs the teaspoon of salt for it to be effective. And just in case you're wondering, here is the one that I washed under the tap. I'll let you decide which method you want to use. This next gadget is one that I chose. It's a, a candy play pen. We uh, got this strange device, this strange pen, and we got one little packet of these uh, these candies and then we went and bought another bunch of them as well. What we've done is we've put a couple of pieces of the candy in there inside the pen. We've plugged it in, it's been heating up. I can tell this because it's quite hot and uh, the little light has turned blue. Oh, something is sizzling. Something, there's a noise, but nothing's coming out. This little thing here is moving. We'll just wait. The little sound it was making has stopped. But is it still working? Uh, Do we have power it's still? Turned off. Turned itself off. We're now waiting for it to turn blue again. What is this for though? Because little kids couldn't use it because it's too hot. Oh, I think little kids could use it. Could What's they? going on? It's out of candy. That was nah. two candy sticks already. Yeah, because it's going back up inside. Wow, really? Yep. It's a little slower than I'd hoped for. Oh, do you have to wait all over again? Mm. Wow, that's really slow. If you could just put the next one in and keep going, then it'll be fine. But no, you have to wait this one. Here we go. We're on. Yep. Got a monobrow there. Just needs a bit of, bit of work. Ready, let's go. It just turned itself off again. <gasps> Frustrated much, not happy. That's the third time it's done that. It's just taken ages to turn blue and then it's turned blue and turned itself off. So the concept I like, I'm clever for the concept, not quite there on design yet. That could just be the one that we have. Yeah. But certainly that's frustratingly slow and then turns off. I ended up taking the candy pen apart and soaking the nib in water for several hours to unblock it and finally got it working. But even when it does work, I seemed to spend more time waiting around than I could actually draw with it. This is as much as I could draw in one go before it needed reloading again. One positive though is that the candy is sugar free so the decorations are fairly stable. If this was made out of sugar it would absorb moisture from the air and would be so much more fragile. Our next gadget is a baggy opener. That's what it says. Let's open the baggy opener. What is a baggy opener? Well, you go like this Ooh. and then you get a baggy. You put that down there. Does it vacuum up? Oh, I think so. Hmm. Or maybe. Or maybe no. not. And then you put your baggie in there. And there. Look at that. Holds it open for you. Holds it open for you. Wait before you test it. Let me show you my baggie open. <laughs> I like to fold down the top of the bag so that the top stays all clean. Wow. And put it over like that. Oh, wow. All right, ready? One, yeah. two, three, go. Does the whole can fit? It does. Really? Tremendous baggy opener. Oh, I've dropped some peaches. Oh, 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 I think we've got a win. Okay, now you've got to seal it though. Oh, well, that's easy. I think it's a bit over full for sealing, personally. I think not for me, not with left. the baggy opener. Now available. Mine is definitely over full, and I'm not going to be able to get them out. I think yours is a win in this situation. I think it is. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. I'm going to have to give that one a clever. Normally, I would just use this, but I wouldn't overfill it. Yeah, you, feel, you seem a little reluctant with that clever. Yeah. Next, we have not really a gadget. It's mm. a 3D cake tin that I picked up from the second-hand store. Okay. This is a Wilton one, and it says that it's from 1984. Ah. So, a long time ago. Um, and do you remember how I feel about 3D cake tins? Uh, ambivalent? I don't think that 3D cake tins are good for cake, but I do think they're good for something else, which is? 
Chocolate. Chocolate, that's right. So I've already filled this one with chocolate and I want to see how well it has worked. At the chocolate places, they have a, a machine that turns it consistently like this so that it gets an even spread all over the whole thing. I'm that machine myself for this one and I got a bit bored of turning it. So I just <laughs> put it in the fridge. So it's probably a bit heavy on one side, but I'm hoping that it's covered everywhere. There's only one way out. There we go. That sounded like a crack. Yeah, well, it sounded satisfyingly cracking. Yeah, but it sounds like I might have just broken the bunny. Surely not. I might have. Nothing breaks a bunny. Oh, oh it does have a crack. Look. Oh, where? Look. Oh, it does. We can uh, do surgery. Bunny surgery. Mm hmm. Definitely a broken bunny. Uh, oh. 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 Oh, that's a pity. Nearly. It's nearly a bunny. Can you fix it? Well, you could, but everyone's going to be able to tell that you broke the bunny. <laughs> and look how much chocolate is at the bottom. You can that is a heavy set bunny. <laughs> you can tell the issue was that I got bored of standing there turning it. So what's happened is we've got really thin chocolate here. So yes, you could use this for a 3D mould, but you're actually going to need to stand there and turn it. You might remember this gadget from the last Clever on Yes, ever. I do. It's a cheese curler and mm -hmm. it's supposed to be used with Tip de Moines, is that how you say it? Cheese. Uh, sure. Which we couldn't get hold of and mm. normal cheese doesn't work with it. And then I'd heard you could use it with chocolate, couldn't get chocolate to work with it. Sure. And then one of our subscribers emailed me and said you can buy specific chocolate that is made to use with this machine. Cool. So that is what I have done. And that is an interesting piece of chocolate. Now we will see. If it works. Let's go. A reprise. Oh yeah, that's yeah, looking that's good. That's looking much better. Well done. Look at that. That's much better. Yeah. Thank you for the tip. It's very, very soft. Like as soon as it touches your hands, it's melting. So mm. there's obviously some other fat in it other than cocoa butter that's got a lower melting point. Shall I try it? I think you're the chocolate fan. Let us know. It almost tastes hazelnutty. Oh, okay. What's in it? I'm going to have to translate that because so you know what's in it. Well, that was a bit of fun. So if you have any gadgets that you'd like us to review, let us know in the comments below and we'll do it for you. And with thanks to my patrons for your wonderful support, here is a list of absolute legends. Make it a great week by being kind to others and we'll see you on Friday. Bye. You can just go in the bin. Yeah, that is a strange idea. <laughs>